Welcome. Today we had our mega open house here at 1302 Alhambra Circle. We had Dr. Paul George, Miami historian, provide us with a guided tour of this beautiful property. He was able to bring to life the history of Roxy Bolton and her contribution to the women's movement. If you would like a private tour of the home, make sure to contact us. Oh my gosh, we are so excited. Good to be here, Allie. So, have you been in the house? I haven't, I'm just uh, really impressed. Taking it online? Yeah, taking it online is the best way to put it, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Paul George. Thanks for having me here, you've been really kind. I got my guided tour about a half an hour ago, and it's just great. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, I met Roxy uh, over the telephone, and I'm going to kind of weave that into this particular So I wrote up a outline I'd like to talk off of about her life, and she had such an incredible life. Uh, she was actually named for a Mississippi doctor who delivered her. She uh, was born and grew up in a little tiny town called Duck Hill uh, in Mississippi, uh, supposedly named for a one-time Choctaw Indian chief who lived in that area, born in 1926. And here she ends up in Miami, but really in a, in a national and international stage. I mean, she just really made the lights everywhere because of what she did. So she was a country girl, finished high school, never looked beyond that in formal education, and of course became a powerhouse. Um, at 10 years of age, she witnessed in Duck Hill the lynching of two young African-American males. And her son, Dan, and Dan was like really the keeper of the flame of his family. She had several children. But Dan would say later on that he thought the entire town turned out 500 people. And he maintained that that event just, I guess we could use it to traumatize her, but became a catalyst for her future activism. You know, working on behalf of people uh, who really needed help, or groups who needed help, genders who needed help. And this might have been the trigger for it. Uh, everybody in the town came out for it. Unfortunately, that happened in a lot of small towns uh, throughout the American South at that time, and later, and earlier. Um, she arrived in Miami in the uh, 1950s, real young, married, married briefly, about five years, had a child, and the marriage was dissolved. And she came back to Miami in 1964, having remarried uh, a man named David Bolton, who was an attorney, but also a, uh, a Navy commander at the end of World War II. And he was former chief war crimes prosecutor in the South Pacific after the war. So the guy really has some interesting credentials. They lived abroad a few different places eventually she wanted to come back here so uh david came back here of course with her and she lived in this beautiful home from 1965 till 1988 uh and here she found it and she did so many things in the house we had that wonderful guided tour i might lose my job as a tour guide after the tour you gave <laughs> i'm actually right now very early about this whole situation it was a, it was a great tour. but um but long story short um uh, she found it, among other things, here, and I'm going to get into her achievements very shortly. The historical marker outside has some of them listed. But she founded the Miami Dade chapter of the National Organization of Women in the late 1960s. And it's interesting what happened, though. Soon after that, her husband David, and um, she apparently believed that she was happily married to him, came home one night, sat at the dinner table, children around. They had three, and she had a fourth from her first marriage and announced that he was leaving the house. Uh, and he was leaving her for another woman, whom he married, and then apparently got married again and again. But there's a somewhat happy ending to this story, which is really amazing, after, I'm sure, a lot of years of pain. So um, he left, and then financial issues, uh, because she was a full-time mom and a full-time civic activist with not much of a stream of money coming in, caused her, prompted her in the late 1960s, uh, to sell the house, excuse me, late 1980s to sell the house. And uh, she moved elsewhere. Um, but what's interesting is, is that um, once again, their son, uh, whom I mentioned before, David Bolton, came to his mom one time, and this was probably at the beginning of this century, and he said, um, Dad's in really bad health, and she knew that. He had uh, heart attacks and strokes, and um, he'd like to move in back with you knowing that she would take great care of him. And so they came together again. And um, I kind of entered this, this is my disclosure, I entered this scene really in a very tangential way. I received a call from her about 2001, 2002, and she was wonderful. She was also in bad health by this time. And she said, you know, I know you do tours the Miami City Cemetery, and we know that's the most historic graveyard in Miami, if not the entire county. I believe it, the entire county it is. 
And um, I'm interested in buying a, a grave site for both myself and my former husband, who I'm real close to anyway. And I said, well, you know, the city, please come in and make yourselves a home. Uh, the, the city doesn't really sell lots of plots anymore in the cemetery. And they haven't sold plots in the cemetery for probably 80 years or so, probably since the 1940s. It's considered a city park. But I said, look, um, I'll get a hold of the cemetery sexton, and I'm going to give you his number, too. See, in the back of my mind, I knew how compelling she was on a telephone. Even in bad health, I knew that she could probably talk this guy into somehow finding a plot that she would buy. And I talked to him also. And um, she got a plot for her and her alien husband. And then when her time came, of course, when his time came. And um, he passed away in 2005, and he's buried right next to her. Um, what's interesting is that when she passed away just two years ago, she um, stated in writing that she wanted a masonry bench taken from her house and uh, brought on over to the cemetery. Uh, and she wanted anybody to consult with her, anybody who's having problems in their life, to be able to sit on that bench, kind of look down at her grave site, which is unmarked, and just talk with her. Maybe she could help them from the vantage point of the grave to resolve it. So there is a bench next to her grave site, and husband, her ex-husband David is right next to her. But let's get back to the home for a second. This home was designed, this is very interesting, by a man named C. Leroy Kinports. And his name had never cropped up in my psyche in terms of prominent historical, sorry about that, Miami architects. So I did some research on him, came to find out that he was a very prominent architect in the Northeast, as well as in parts of the Midwest. He designed some really singular buildings in Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, and Michigan. And I kept thinking to myself, he did the design in 1933. I said, well, why did he come down here? Uh, what made him come down here? It turned out that in a little bit of the research I did, how are you going to say it? Good to see you. In a little bit of the research I did, I found out that he had been an associate one time with a man named Phineas Paste, who was the supervising architect from George Merrick in Coral Gables during the heady days of Coral Gables, which wasn't 1933 when he designed this. Coral Gables just coming out of receivership at that time. And George Merrick was destitute at that time. But, uh, so there was a connection with Phineas Paste. And that's what probably led him down here for this particular job, to design this building here. And it's also interesting to note, and I took a good look at it, um, even though it was designed in 1933, it's just textbook of what a 1925 Carl Gables Mediterranean-style building would look like in every element of the design. I was even looking for hints of an emergent streamlined majority art deco style in the house. I can't find it. So he really, this is really kind of a retro look. It's about almost 10 years past the peak of the Mediterranean style. Here it is. And that for me makes it even more exceptional that they were designed to see. You find buildings in Carl Gables. Carl Gables is in such bad shape financially, the city, that in 1932, it issued four building permits. I mean, every builder in America would like to develop in Carl Gables today. Four building permits in one year. That was the Nate year for Carl Gables, 1932. Here he is in 33. It's not much better, but a house is being designed and a house is being built at that time. So uh, the home, of course, is a Florida heritage site, not only because it's a jewel, but also because Roxy Bolton not only lived here, but this is where her great civic activism emanated from. Um, but it's interesting also about the home, there's some quirky elements to it, not so much the style, but some of the things that happen here. When you have a whole bunch of children living in the house, anything can happen. Uh, my two sons, when they were about nine and seven, set off a rocket from the floor, the first floor of the house that we live in, and it penetrated the ceiling upstairs, and a uh, brand new baby girl was upstairs asleep, and you can imagine the commotion, the smoke all over the place, and what have you. But, I've never seen them apologize before or since like they did that day. <laughs> but how about two-year-old David Bolton getting caught in this, this railing here as he was trying to mount the stairwell? And it was such a tight fit for the poor kid that Roxy had to call the firefighters of Coral Gables to help dislodge him. And they finally got him out, and they actually stretched the bar in order to get him out of here. God knows how he got in there, another Houdini type of thing. Um, Rocky's kitchen, we had that magnificent tour of the kitchen, was also, as I see it, her situation room. I mean, that's where so much happened. 
At one point, there were two telephones there, and many times she had each phone to each ear, and she had these simultaneous conversations going on. At one point. The breakfast room was also where Roxy, if I can use the term bribe a politician, I don't want to use the term quid pro quo, since it's being bandied about a lot these days. But that's where she bribed a politician or two with her famous homemade biscuits made with a deep south touch, emblematic of Mississippi roots. She was a great cook, and obviously a southern style cook. Uh, her dad had farmed, uh, her mother was in the home a good bit, but she also taught for a spell. A mosaic tile floor, and I'm just so impressed that everything's intact with the floor in the living room, where we are, is where an Indiana senator birched by in the mid-70s and played his case to Roxy about why he thought he was a good candidate for the American presidency. And Birch Pye was uh, a very interesting man. I met him several times on Capitol Hill. He was very folksy, but very intelligent. Um, let's get back again. Very folksy, but very determined. And he came here to play his case. She had already met him before um, in, in terms of the rights amendment, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get back to him in just a minute. The dining room of this beautiful home, I'm looking right across the way at it right now, was what one writer described as the cauldron of feminist revolt, end quote. Sometimes, as I said before, two telephones ringing simultaneously, Roxy picking up both around the same time. You're talking about, these are three cell phone days. You can imagine the cords and all coming together. And here she is on both phones at the same time. Activism and accomplishments, and, and this is why... Uh, not only because she was a really good person, but this is really why this house has taken on such a cachet. Eleanor Roosevelt, whom Roxy met at the Democratic Party's presidential nominating convention in 1956, once said to Roxy, you must do the things you think you cannot do. Roxy, because time was barely 30 years of age when she met her. And she took this advice to heart. The things that seem impossible and the things that I want to go and that became kind of like her mantra. And as we know, her activism and advocacy over a period of years and decades was tireless, it was profound, it was very deep meaning. For example, and there's many examples, she played an active role in the push for an equal rights amendment, persuading, again, Birch by to introduce that bill to the Congress, which she did as a U.S. Senator from Indiana. She led what is said to have been another achievement, the first March Against Rape, as it was built at the time, 1970s, gathering 100 women and men who were leaders in different areas and endeavors in the area and outside of the area. I marched to the county courthouse in downtown Miami to really bring attention to this horrendous situation. In 1993, she organized Florida's first crime watch meeting to help stem crime against women in particular. She, and this is one of the things that so many people remember about her, she also, even before that time, long before 1993, convinced the National Hurricane Center, which had headquarters down here, so it was kind of convenient for her to go over there personally, face to face. You know, it was tough enough to deal with Roxy on the phone if you had a different viewpoint. To meet her face to face was absolutely intimidating. So she convinced the National Hurricane Center to drop the time-worn practice of naming hurricanes only after women. And after a nearly a 10-year campaign, that's how long it took the National Hurricane Service to begin to bend and yield to this. Um, she never gave up. She was indefatigable on this. The National Weather Service finally, in 1979, dubbed a hurricane Bob, which was kind of a break from the past. And Roxy's actions were predicated on her dislike of weathermen in general. In fact, she hated the idea that weathermen would gush something like, Carol has destroyed... Louisiana, or Betsy has torn up parts of the Florida Keys. For her, this was a slur on women. Or as she argued, quote, women deeply resent being arbitrarily associated with disaster. At one point in this naming struggle, and again, it went on for over 10 years, she suggested perhaps facetiously that hurricanes should also be called hemicanes. Another time she thought they should be named for the or lobbying members of the U.S. Congress. After all, Roxy suggested, quote, senators delight in having things named after them, something like Goldwater annihilates Florida. How about that for a hurricane name? For Barry Goldwater. 
Betty Friedan, who helped launch the modern feminist movement with the publication of a book called The Feminist League in 1963, uh, she recalled later that Roxy had, quote, written me all incensed at the practice of using women's names to name hurricanes. So that's probably among her most visible crusades, but it's certainly not the most important. She founded the local chapter, I've already hinted at this, of the National Organization of Women in 1966, with the goals of fighting for equal pay, equal rights, mandatory maternity leave, more women on task forces, reform of Florida statutes to widen the definition of rape. Rocky became the, pre the national vice president of now, National Organization of Women, in 1969, and later she split differences uh, over different matters with them. She also, and this is a sort of a highly Miami type of thing, and it certainly gathered a lot of newspaper coverage when it was happening. Uh, she fought to eliminate the men only grills at local department stores like Burlines and Jordan Marsh, which were the two big department stores in and around downtown Miami. She argued that, quote, men and women sleep together, why can't they eat together? <laughs> After her stern lectures to the men's grill at Burt Ines and the captain's table at Jordan Marsh, the administrators of these facilities agreed to open them up to women too. When Roxy received a letter from the manager of, the, of a Playboy Plaza Hotel over on Miami Beach as he moved north about two miles past the Fountain Blue Hotel, inviting her to bring a meeting of the Florida or the Miami of Dane County chapter of National Organization of Women to the Playboy Club for a meeting, she went ballistic, asking him in a tart letter how he and his male staff would like to walk around with a lot of cotton for a tail for Playboy bunnies. She prefaced this query with the following takedown. Your, quote, your colossal gall is exceeded only by my tolerance, despite the stress of my good nature. So she certainly had that vein of humor to her, too. She waged, and this is so important, a successful campaign to overturn National Airlines' policy of terminating pregnant flight attendants. And instead, included in their contracts with the carrier the then novel concept of maternity leave, which would become eventually, not too long after this, universally adopted among airlines. She convinced Bay County, that's what it was called until 1997, to establish a commission on the status of women. Some background here. On more than one occasion, Roxy Crow, that women were underrepresented in the Dade County Commission. At a time that she was beginning to talk about this, there were nine county commissioners with just one woman commissioner among the nine. And so she helped found the Dade County Commission for Women that fought with some success, and eventually a lot of success, with the additional political empowerment of women. She established the county's first shelter for abandoned and homeless women. Another tremendous game. It was said that Roxy's phone during the high point of her activism never stopped ringing from women in distress or from other groups reaching out to her for assistance. She posted as widely as she could in those pre-internet days her telephone number to different women's groups. In 1972, women in, women in Distress was founded and lodged in a small home near downtown Miami. It was the first, and she got a gentleman, a mover and shaker in the community, to buy the house. It was the first of its kind in the United States. She also spearheaded the creation of, a first, of the first rape treatment center in the United States. In 1971, Roxy led a march in the streets of downtown Miami to draw attention to rape victims. Three years later, a rape treatment center opened in Jackson Memorial Hospital. Two decades later, it took a long time for this, the center was named, was christened, the Roxy O'Neill Bolton Rape Treatment Center. In its storied existence, this center, this treatment center, has treated thousands of victims ranging from, this is hard to imagine, age two weeks to 98 years of age. She organized the first crime watch in Florida. As an early leader of the National Organization of Women, Bolton was instrumental in securing, once again, Birch Fi to put his magic wand over what she was doing with this particular issue. She initiated the push to designate August 26th each year as National Women's Equality Day, pushing hard on President Richard Nixon and his administration to make this day a reality. And they did. In fact, the proclamation was presented to her on the day it became official by Richard Nixon as president, who praised her for her diligence in making the day a reality. In 1971, 
And again, so much of that activism, late 60s, early to mid 70s, and then it continues beyond, but really the foundation is laid at that time. That was a period of tremendous activism period in America. 1971, she and a small cadre of women occupied the office of UN President Henry King Stanford, a usually very affable person, but he was very stubborn and opening up high-level administrative positions, uh, chairpersons uh, positions to win. And uh, very long story short, she had badgered him on her own and then way to, to move forward in this progressive step. And he had hesitated again and again. And so one day she gathered up six women, a small cadre of women. She said, bring your sleeping bags. We're going to invade Henry King Stanford's office in the University of Miami. We're going to occupy it until he makes these concessions. And they moved in there, occupied the office. They would not leave until he finally decided to make concessions. Concessions meaning that higher level positions now begin to be open to women at the university, both in administration and in the academic areas. A regular at Carl Gable City Hall until shortly before her death, and she was very, very sick the last several years. She would still be helped over to City Hall when there was an issue on the agenda that she thought she really needed to be around for. And, and she advocated in her last years for the relocation of sidewalk trees. And she was always a longtime advocate of the black section of Coral Gables, which is on the other side of US 1, and is primarily Bahamian. And she railed against the controversial placement just in the last handful of years prior to her death of a trolley bar in that neighborhood, and was successful in negating that move. As noted, many of Roxy's missions and advocacy began with a phone call to her home. How about this? Once a woman on the other end of the line uh, had been arrested for indecent exposure for breastfeeding her baby in a Miami park. Roxy hung up the phone after talking to this woman who had called her and immediately called Tallahassee, Florida's Attorney General, Bob Shevin. Bob Shevin was in a meeting, and so his assistant said, I, we really can't put you through right now. She said, it's an emergency. I need to talk with him. He left the meeting. She just bent his ear on the telephone. Uh, and she asked him this question, or shut <clears throat> quote, did your mother breastfeed you, end quote. <clears throat> Roxy eventually had the charges, was instrumental in charges being dropped against the woman. As for the park, it was created in 1992, many years later. It is now the Women's Park, a county park, and the first park in the U.S. dedicated to women. Honoring past and present women leaders, it's located at 102nd Avenue in West Flagler Street. Again, it was created really to recognize the role of women, past, present, and future for their contributions to make life better for people in Miami-Dade County. In fact, it was there and on June 10th, 2017, that a celebration of life was held for Roxy Bolt. Now, Roxy assisted all those at Singh who came to her for assistance for, among other issues, better treatment for Haitian detainees from Miami Detention Camp and their children. Women's admission to the nation's military academies. Legal backing for Miami mothers who wish to nurse their babies in public. She's also credited with opening the highly influential, especially politically speaking, Tiger Bay Club to women, which is where a lot of early uh, political happenings take place, where people announce they're going to run for office or begin to gather support at a meeting like that. Roxy Bolton initiated the rehabilitation program for young prostitutes in Miami Dade County. This program offered educational opportunities to incarcerated prostitutes and labor to keep those released from incarceration off the streets and away from drug use. Roxy held tightly to the belief that and this helps explain a lot of her action. Quote, no matter what anyone tells you, one person can make a difference. She also announced that, and I'm quoting here again, you have to dare to be bold. Women sometimes will talk about a problem, agonize about it too much. You've got to go out and, like the Marines, hit the beaches. You can't just hang around. You've got to move, end quote. Her awards have been plentiful, as you can imagine. 1984, she was inducted into the Florida Women's Hall of Fame. 1988, won the Miami Herald Spirit of Excellence Award. 1999, this home was dedicated as a Florida Heritage Site. 2014, the National Women's History Project celebrated Bolton, Washington, D.C., as one of that year's History Month honorees. She was also honored by the Venerable Miami Women's Club as, quote, a leading force of the women's rights movement in Miami. 
In 2015, Miami-Dade Parks honored her as a trailblazer during its 27th annual in the Company Women Awards Ceremony. And so it just goes on and on and on. And if you looked at her obituaries, which I did, New York Times, Washington Post, the, uh, the Telegraph in England, um, gosh, the name of the other great British um, newspaper based in London, London Times, um, they had obituaries on it. It was almost an international type of thing, certainly in the Western world. So this, in a, a, a brief way, is the story of Roxy. But I'll also touch, though, uh, when she called me that day about her former husband, that uh, she was taking care of him. And I had heard about her health as being bad at, at that time, too. And she wanted a burial site for both of them. And she was able to get there. And that really meant a lot, as far as I was concerned. So I'm open to any questions you might have on Roxy Bolton. Uh, I mean, not only inhabited this house, but made this house really, uh, I think, ground zero for so much of the women's movement in America in the 1960s and 70s and the 1980s. You know, even after she was out of here, uh, she was still very active. Things. Questions or comments anybody might have about this really unusual person? Very gracious person. That phone conversation, I'll always remember. I mean, she was so endearing. It was Actually, when she called, she said, hi, um, very formal, Dr. Rudd. This is Roxy Bolton. I was mortified. I said to myself, what have I done now? That she's going to die? <laughs> this is probably, and again, this is more than 15 years ago. And so, you know, her activism was still very much around at that time, and I was just mortified, and then she just, my gosh, this army complete. But any questions or comments? Is that cemetery right off the sunset? Oh, uh, no, it's the, that's Pinewood. Okay. Which opened in 1897, right. and this one did also. This is at 1800 Northeast Second Avenue, so it's about okay. a mile and a half north of downtown. It was forlorn, abandoned, scary. Yeah. And now the whole neighborhood is. Yeah, it's still running next door. Temple Israel's across the street. Yeah. That's the next sign. across yeah, the street. Across the street. Yeah. And then you, you wouldn't go over there. Certainly not at nighttime. It was wide open one point. Yeah, I used to work at Fitzgerald's. Right oh, next and that was right next door. Yeah. For all those years. Yeah. Um, and the neighborhood's gone crazy with redevelopment. So right. it's. An interesting place once again. Yeah. Yeah. Questions anybody might have? She was mm. my person. Just a you know, long list of achievements. Um, I would hope that we could just achieve some of this you know, in our lifetimes. But you know, it's interesting because she was directly connected with the highest levels of power. The connection to Carter with Richard Nixon, you mentioned Birch Bay. Uh, she was up in Tallahassee for a lot of major state issues in the state legislature. We might need her up there now, in fact, to shake up things a little bit. Yes, ma'am. She lives in Glenmore, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not, there's no marker yet, and she's been buried there for over two years. She wanted a very simple marker that would say, a woman. But it hasn't appeared. And her son, Dan, has really been this, this great force for the family. And I've never met him, but I would think that he's probably looking after this is something that happened. Is her name on the message or not? It's not. That's not a, no. It's a beautiful white masonry bench. Mm 